What's up guys and welcome to One Take. Today we're talking about Dark Season 3 Episode 4, titled The Origin. This video will of course have spoilers through Episode 4, but I haven't watched any of Season 3 beyond that, so no spoilers for the second half of the season. Before we jump into the episode, just a quick reminder, if you haven't done so already, to hit that like button, hit the subscribe button, and of course the bell icon, so you get notified the next time we do a video and you can keep up with my coverage on the rest of the season. Jumping into the episode, overall it was a mixed episode for me, but that doesn't mean it was good and bad, it just means that where some episodes are all great, this one was a mix of some good and some great. On the good side, there's the Hannah and Egon story. That stuff was interesting, I'm invested in those characters, but at times it felt kind of disconnected from the overarching dark plot. I find myself wondering, where is this Hannah storyline going, especially when at the same time we're watching Jonas and Marta on a journey that is at the very core explaining everything that's going on in the dark world. So they're uncovering these vast mysteries that I'm so invested in, and we keep cutting from that to the Hannah Egon stuff. So at times that detracted a little bit for me. On the other hand, the Jonas and Marta stuff this episode, I absolutely loved and thought it resonated emotionally in a big way. You have this dynamic where Jonas has gone through hell the last couple of seasons, and now he's forced into this situation where he needs to take Marta from the alternate world and force her to go through a similar journey. Doing that, A, there's the guilt of pulling Marta into all this, and B, he just takes stock of everything that is resting on his shoulders. And watching him in this episode, I just see all of that in his face every responsibility that's been thrust upon him, and then just him and Marta together when they finally kiss later in the episode. It feels like they get this moment of joy, but it's all within the eye of the storm right before this impending second apocalypse. So I loved all that stuff, and without further ado, let's get into the recap itself. We'll start on the Prime World in 1954, and that's the terminology I tend to use Prime World, meaning the world we watched for the first two seasons, and Alternate World for Marta's World, the other world that we're visiting. So on the Prime World in 1954, Trant as a child is walking alone in the woods. He passes by the cave, and as he does so, the lip-scarred man, the trio, appear. And they reveal a few pieces of information. A, the lip-scarred man doesn't have a name. And B, he implies that he is Trant's father. Then, the Lipsguard Man gives Trant a bracelet that belonged to his mother, Agnes. This episode is called The Origin, and that's the big reveal we're building up to throughout this episode. One thing Dark has always been great at, though, is rather than keeping you on the edge of your seat waiting for one big reveal, they give you answers to questions on a pretty consistent rhythm as sort of the appetizer to the bigger reveal. So this is one example of that. We've been waiting to find out who is Trant's father, and therefore Ulrich's grandfather. We knew that Trant's mother was Agnes, Noah's sister. Who is the father? Here we find out it's the Lipsgard man who is credited as simply unknown. Then we see Ines and Claudia as children looking at some adult magazines. They talk about Trant with Jana nearby, and we can see that Jana is jealous of whatever is developing between Claudia and Trant. In this conversation, we also find out that Trant's mother, Agnes, has been missing. We know that that's probably because she got called away on time travel duties, but to everyone else, her disappearance is a total mystery. Over and over, I've praised the acting on Dark, but one particular area where it especially deserves praise is with the children's acting, because oftentimes that can be a weak spot on shows, but the children on this show do an excellent job and tend to fire on all cylinders. Here, there's a great example of it, where there are these subtle facial expressions between Ines and Jana. When Ines asks Claudia, have you ever seen one? Claudia sort of nods, and then Ines smirks and asks, Trant? 
When Ines asks that, you can clearly see the jealousy on Jana's face. And then Ines changes the subject to the discussion of where has Tron's mother disappeared to. That whole interplay between the three of them, I thought was just a great sample of how great the acting is on this show, even when it comes to the child actors. Later, Jana finds Trant at the lake by himself, holding on to the bracelet given to him by the unknown man. And in their conversation, Trant starts to open up to her. He says, I like to write, you know, stories. Then tells Jana that she has a nice smile. And that, I think, seals the deal where she basically falls in love with him. And we're planting the seeds. 33 years later, Trant will be married to Jana while having an affair with Claudia on the side. In fact, Trant and Claudia will have Regina together. Meanwhile, Claudia goes to the Doppler home to tutor Helga. While she's there, she overhears Mr. Doppler, or Burned Doppler, arguing on the phone because he's still trying to get the building permit for his nuclear plant. He believes that the local government is being paid off by coal companies to prevent them from allowing the nuclear plant to be built. Once he finishes on the phone, he sees Claudia's there and calms down, then very creepily says to her, Look at you, you're all grown up. Helga will be pleased to see you, then gives her more money than he's supposed to. When Claudia is hesitant to take all that money, he gives her a life lesson. If you really want something, then take it. Things don't just happen by themselves. This must resonate with Claudia because we know she will grow up to take Mr. Doppler's job as the nuclear plant director. Then whatever official is blocking the building permit for the nuclear plant gets a visit from the Lipscard Trio, where they give an interesting, cryptic, creepy monologue, as always, before making him sign the building permit. I've said it a few times already, but this is such a great villain. It's so creepy the way the middle-aged iteration of the man will do most of the talking, but whoever is being spoken to midway through the conversation will always kind of awkwardly turn and notice that the child version of this character is creepily staring at him with just such intensity. And by the way, this show always has amazing casting, and with this trio, it's always especially noticeable because the physical similarities between the three of them is so impressive. And looking at the end credits, I realized, by the way, just a fun fact, the middle-aged man and the older version of himself are actually father and son in real life. Jacob Deal is the middle-aged one, and Hans Deal is the older actor. After their chat at the lake, Trant and Jana are walking back home through the woods, and they continue to open up to each other. Jana asks Trant about his upbringing. He reveals that he never knew his father, but his mother always said that he's a bad person. Then Jana asks, what is it like to grow up in a home? And Trant shows her the cigarette burns on his arm. So clearly he is a child that suffered some sort of abuse. He asks Jana if she can keep a secret and then tells her the man this morning, I don't even want to know if he's my dad and I'm glad my mom is gone. Then he gives Jana the bracelet which belonged to his mother. I'm hoping we get a little more insight into Trant's relationship with his mother Agnes. He says he's glad she's gone and I don't know if that's because she was also abusive towards him or maybe she was sort of passive and just complicit in the abuse by not doing anything to prevent it. Now, even if she was a fine mother, he might still resent her for the fact that she apparently disappeared and abandoned him. In general, we don't know a whole lot about Agnes and her motivations. It's not even clear which side, if there are sides, she aligns with. It seemed like she was working with Claudia, then it seemed like she betrayed Claudia to go back into Adam's good graces, but it's impossible to know whether she did that because she was truly betraying Claudia or because Claudia wanted her to go back to Adam as part of the master plan. All of it's unclear. I have a feeling we'll get to know more about Agnes in the next couple of episodes. Then Claudia shows up and interrupts the conversation between Trant and Jana. 
Claudia and Trant hold hands, so apparently their relationship has developed further and they head home. Let's check in with Hannah and Egon. You'll recall last season, Hannah snatched Jonas's time machine and went back in time 60 plus years to taunt Ulrich and then go start an affair with Egon. They, after their lovemaking, Egon tells Hannah, I love you, and then Hannah simply smiles. Then Egon gives her the St. Christopher necklace. In this scene, it seems like Hannah is sort of the Ulrich in this relationship. Back in 2019, whenever Hannah told Ulrich, I love you, he would never reciprocate. He would simply say, you're beautiful. So that's kind of the treatment that Hannah is giving Egon here. Hannah comments that she's not feeling well. And in this scene, we also learn that Hannah is going by the name Katerina. By the way, when Egon gives her that St. Christopher necklace, Anytime I see that necklace, I don't think to myself, that's a St. Christopher necklace. Because of all the time travel, I assume it is a the St. Christopher necklace. So as soon as I saw it, I was wondering, how is it eventually going to end up at the lake where Jonas and Marta find it? in 2019. Then Doris, Egon's wife, visits him at the police station and she's starting to get suspicious. He said he was gonna be one place, she finds him somewhere else, but that's not why she's there. Doris is looking for Agnes. As a reminder, Doris and Agnes got very close, started a relationship, she cheated on Egon with Agnes, so she wants to track down where did Agnes disappear to. Well, cleaning up Agnes's things, she found a handkerchief with the letters HT on it. Coincidentally, when Agnes disappeared, so did a local minister, Hanno Tauber, who we know is actually Noah. So Hanno Tauber, or Noah, went missing at the same time Agnes did. And Agnes mentioned that her husband is a man of God. So... Doris puts two and two together. She thinks that HT on Agnes's handkerchief is Hanno Tauber. So maybe this Hanno fellow is Agnes's husband and the two of them ran off, which would be bad news because Agnes told Doris that Agnes's husband is not a good person. Egon basically writes off the evidence and Doris asks, why would she just disappear? Egon, starting to get cynical, says... Who knows what goes on inside the heads of you women? That causes Doris to essentially storm off. Then Egon gets a visit from Mrs. Doppler, Helga's mother. He assumes that Mrs. Doppler is there to ask about any developments on Helga's case, meaning who kidnapped him, why, where did they take him, but that's not why she's there. After Doris was there to ask about Agnes's disappearance, Mrs. Doppler is there to ask about Hanno Tauber, Noah's disappearance. We know that she was a fan of Noah because Noah visited her after Helga disappeared, and after Helga returned, Noah was the one who was able to get Helga to speak again. After Doris doesn't have any luck with Egon, she heads to the church to see if anybody there knows anything about Agnes or Hanno Tauber and where they might have disappeared to. Inside the church, she finds the lip scarred trio. And as always, they all stare at her creepily while the middle aged iteration of this unknown man does all the talking. Doris acts like she's concerned about Trant, saying a boy needs his mother, so we need to track her down. But the man calls her out. You aren't really interested in Trant. What you really care about is his mother. You miss the woman, Agnes, and he says the ways of the heart cannot be explained. It does what it wants. Just ask your husband. Then he all but tells her that Egon has been having an affair with another woman. As he says this, the man reaches into his pocket, and that got me worried for a second, because usually when he does that, the next thing that happens is the Garrett wire comes out, whoever he's talking to dies. But before he takes his hand out of his pocket, Doris leaves the church in a hurry. So we've seen this trio around sort of making sure things fall into place. And I have to wonder what the trio's motivation is. From the last couple of episodes, it would appear that he's working with older Marta. But to what end? If we believe middle-aged Marta later in this episode, you have to choose between both worlds. Only one of them can survive. And my impression is that older Marta, or Eve, wants her world to survive. 
The trio has been doing all of his business on the prime world, our world. So my suspicion is that Marta sends the trio to Jonas's prime world to essentially ensure that events occur as they need to so the apocalypse can happen. We saw the trio make sure that the nuclear plant gets created, and I'm assuming that informing Doris that her husband is cheating on her is one more domino that needs to fall in order for the apocalypse to happen and ultimately for Marta's world to survive. During all this, we know that earlier Hannah mentioned she wasn't feeling well. Well, she goes to the doctor and finds out that she's pregnant with Egon's child. She goes to the police station and informs Egon of this. He doesn't take it that well and asks, is it mine? That strikes Hannah the wrong way, and she basically says, I thought you were harmless, but you're all the same. You're all smug and useless. Egon says, you don't know what you're saying. Now, when Hannah says, I thought you were harmless, on the one hand, Egon cheated on his wife, scumbag thing to do. On the other hand, I've got to feel bad for Egon when Hannah says to him, I thought you were harmless. The implication is that Egon has this reputation as being a sort of oaf, a dumb do-gooder. You can take advantage of him. Don't worry about it. He's not going to hurt anybody. And Hannah went through the time stream to find Egon and basically use him as an escape giving basically no thought to the fact that Egon is human and he may develop some feelings for you, which he clearly did, and she does not reciprocate them. Later, Egon and Hannah continue this conversation elsewhere. She tells Egon that she's not planning to keep the baby. She says she realizes she doesn't need anyone, which is something that Jonas told her before she stole his time machine and traveled back in time. So she's realized he's right. All she needs is herself. Before parting ways, Egon writes down the name of someone Hannah can see to have an abortion. The name that's been written is Mrs. Obendorf. So we can assume that this is possibly Eric Obendorf, the boy who disappeared Back in 2019, this is likely his grandmother or another one of his relatives. When Hannah goes to see Mrs. Obendorf in the waiting area, she sees a child named Helena Albers. That is Katerina's mother. Now, the fact that Helena Albers is here to see Mrs. Obendorf tells me that she doesn't want a child, at least not right now. But if she continues through her life not really wanting kids, then that might explain the abusive attitude she has towards Katerina. We know that she's been physically abusive with Katerina, giving her bruises on her face. And last episode, we had the moment where she slaps a young Katerina on the back of her head and tells her to clear the table. Helena says to Hannah, my mother says they go to hell, the ones that are gotten rid of. Hannah tells her that she doesn't believe in hell. She thinks hell is basically what we make for ourselves here on Earth. Then she tells Helena her name, Katerina, and in response, the child tells her that's a very beautiful name. So here we see the seeds planted for Helena to one day name her own child, Katerina. Helena also notices the St. Christopher necklace around Hannah's neck and comments, what a wonderful thought, someone carrying us on our journey, someone watching over us. That's an allusion to the story of St. Christopher where he carried Jesus across a river. Helena goes in to see Mrs. Obendorf, and after this conversation, it seems to have struck a chord with Hannah, so she decides to leave. But before she does, she takes the St. Christopher necklace and leaves it on Helena's things, where we assume she'll find it and hold on to it. In a previous episode, during Katerina's time travel, she runs into an older Helena and sees that she's wearing the St. Christopher necklace. So I commented at the top of this video that the whole Hannah storyline feels somewhat disconnected. Now, it of course has the connection here where we see she is the origin of the name Katerina. She is the origin of the St. Christopher necklace ending up with the Nielsen's, but I assume that her storyline is going to have more importance than just those things. Now, at this moment at least, it seems like she's decided maybe she will have this child. So in the world of dark, your mind immediately goes to, who is this child going to grow up to be? Is it somebody important that we haven't met yet? So I try to think through, are there any characters where we don't know their heritage exactly? And the only one I could think of is Peter Doppler, 
but supposedly Helga is his father. So I can't see a way that Hannah's child here turns out to be Peter. So I'm kind of stumped on this one, but luckily there's only four episodes left, so we should quickly get the answer to that question. Egon returns home with some flowers, which I'm sure can smooth everything over with Doris. He finds her waiting for him, and they have a tense conversation where Doris says she wants a divorce. It's something that should have happened sooner, but now it is time. She's sick of all the secrets between them. This is the moment where Egon essentially begins drinking himself into the Egon we meet in 1986. He starts drinking alone at the table where Claudia and Trant find him later when they return home. She asks where her mom is, and Egon simply replies, The ways of the heart cannot be explained. It does what it wants. Something the trio said to Doris, and then something Doris said to Egon. Child Trant says to Claudia, come on, leave him, and the two of them leave, while Egon continues to drink alone. I thought the line from Trant, come on, leave him, was a pretty brilliant way to subtly show us the effects of the abuse he suffered. The way Trant can so calmly tell Claudia, leave him, implies that he's seen this sort of thing before. He knows what to do with a drunk. You basically need to leave him there. Don't try to intervene. Let's just go. So it just tells us he's been through this before and adds another layer of development for the Trant character. Later during the montage, Claudia joins Trant in his bedroom and gets undressed. Like we said earlier in the video, Trant and Claudia will down the road have a child together, Regina, and in the 80s, Trant will be married to Jana while carrying on an affair with Claudia. I really liked this scene in the context of the montage, but I'm going to talk a little bit more about the montage as a whole later. Next, we're gonna join Jonas and Marta in the post-apocalyptic alternate world. But before we do that, just a quick reminder, if you're enjoying this video, to please go ahead and hit that like button, hit the subscribe button, and of course the bell icon so you get notified the next time we do a video or the next time we go live. So let's leave the prime world and head over to the alternate world where we join Jonas and Marta in 2052. They're in the bunker with middle-aged Marta, and it seems like in this world, Marta has kind of taken on the Claudia role. And instead of putting up photos and strings in the bunker, she's using chalk, which eventually gets replaced with marble, which we see on Eve's floor in her hideout. In all the chalk diagrams, young Marta sees some names crossed out and asks what that means. Middle-aged Marta explains that those are the people that died. Essentially, all your friends and family are going to die. The apocalypse is going to occur on our world in two days. Marta doesn't want to believe any of this. Middle-aged Marta tells them the two of you, Jonas and young Marta, can stop the apocalypse if you get to the nuclear plant and prevent the barrels from being opened. Jonas asks, then what? Eve told me that I can bring my Marta back. Then middle-aged Marta explains Eve lied to you. Only one of the two worlds can be saved. If you save this world, Jonas, everyone can live. Mikkel can live. Isn't that what you wanted? All you have to do is let go of your Marta and let go of your world. Again, Marta, not believing any of this, runs out of the bunker. Before Jonas can go after her, middle-aged Marta tries to make one last pitch to Jonas to save her world. Jonas, on this world, you can be with Marta. It's not impossible. At this point, I would love to know what is in Jonas's head. I've got to assume he can't trust anybody anymore. At least I hope he's learned that lesson. Because Adam has lied to him many times. Adam said, you can go back in time, save Mikkel, save Marta. That turned out to be a lie. Then Jonas meets Eve. And she makes essentially the same claim. You can save your Marta if you do what I say. Now it turns out she is lying. And there was no reason to begin with to assume that Eve has more credibility than Adam. So at this point, I've got to hope that Jonas has basically let go of the idea that you can trust anybody. And the very next scene may give us a little window into what's happening in Jonas's head. Marta runs out of the bunker into the desert. Jonas chases after her. They both sort of fall down. Marta thinks she's going crazy. She's starting to lose it. Jonas very calmly says to her, believe me, I know exactly how it feels. 
At that moment, a sort of melancholy score cuts in, and that was one of my favorite moments of the episode. Like I alluded to at the beginning of the video, one of my favorite things in this episode is that Jonas having to put Marta through this journey just makes him reflect, I think, on everything he's been through. And in that moment, I can just see the weight of all the garbage that's behind him and ahead of him. And I really felt it. And then he says, but I know there's a way to straighten all this out. And I'm not going to stop looking for it. I think that's what she's doing too. So this tells me that for Jonas, no matter what anyone says, even if they tell him you can't get your Marta back, he's not going to listen to them. He believes that he can unravel the knot. He thinks that he can fix everything and he is not going to give up until he figures out a way to do that. You can imagine the kind of road that would lead you down. It would lead you to a place where you start to think the ends justify the means. If Jonas sees any possibility at getting what he wants, at fixing things, I think he's going to go after it, even if it means doing some pretty dark things like experimenting on children. What I'm saying is I think that this relentless pursuit to fix everything is exactly what turns young Jonas into Adam, someone who is doing awful things but in the service of what he believes is the right thing, the thing that will fix everything. Back in the bunker on middle-aged Marta's chalkboard, we see Jonas and Marta connected and leading to the infinity symbol. So that is one of the first very blatant hints we get that the infinity symbol represents an actual human being that is the product of Jonas and Marta being together. Then Noah walks in and says, we are all born of him. You gave him life and he will give us ours. Him, Agnes, Trant, Jana, Ulrich, Katarina, you. Now, on my first viewing, I didn't really know what Noah was talking about. I had a vague notion of what he's implying. But once you get to the end of the episode and you find out that Jonas and Marta have a child together, the lip-scarred man, you realize that Noah is being very literal in what he says to middle-aged Marta. He's saying that the lip-scarred man will get together with Agnes. They will give birth to Trant, who with Janna will give birth to Katarina, who with Ulrich will give birth to you, i.e. Marta, i.e. Marta is her own great-great-grandmother. So I think part of the reason they gave us the reveal last season that Elizabeth is her own grandmother is they wanted us to see a small-scale example of the bootstrap paradox as it applies to humans, meaning humans that exist in a sort of endless loop. Charlotte gives birth to Elizabeth, who gives birth to Charlotte, etc. They wanted to show us one small example of what's happening on a much broader scale. So it's exactly what they've been hinting at. Jonas and Marta are the beginning of a family tree that loops in on itself through all kinds of crazy time travel and creates this time knot that everyone in dark is stuck inside of. Not only that, but the Jonas and Marta that have this child are a Jonas and Marta from two different worlds. So this child is represented by the infinity symbol connecting both worlds. He is a product of two people from either world. After running out of the bunker and having their quick heart to heart, Jonas brings Marta back to the cave and back to 2019, still on the alternate world. They go to Marta's house, and while there, Marta tells Jonas, at school, when you came through the door, I had a feeling like we knew each other from a dream. Then she asks Jonas what Marta is like from his world. Then, instead of words, they physically start to get closer, they kiss, they make love, and they conceive a child who we know will become the lip scarred trio. This is another scene that really resonated with me emotionally because last episode I was going on about how Jonas has not had one moment of joy since his father took his own life so long ago and here he gets his moment of happiness but it's so complicated this isn't his marta it's a different marta they're two days before the apocalypse Jonas is like a fish out of water. He's not even on his own world. This felt like two lonely people that are in the eye of a storm. And then it's all taking place within that montage with the sort of melancholy and eerie music. So this scene just worked for me on so many levels. Such an incredible moment. Then we get a shot of the lip scarred trio, I believe in Eve's lair, where they are writing in the notebook. 
And the Triketcher notebook here looks very fresh. So I wonder if this man might be one of the primary authors behind all the information in that notebook. Finally, we go back to our world in 2053 and we see Adam and Agnes talking at the nuclear plant by the God Particle. Adam gives Agnes a copy of the newspaper article reporting on Claudia's body being found in the 50s. Now in the past, we saw Claudia give Agnes a copy of this article. So it sounds like Claudia originally got it from an older Agnes who then handed it down to a younger Agnes. Adam says to Agnes, life is a gift for those who know how to use it. And Agnes says, are you going to tell Marta what the origin really is. Adam's line, life is a gift for those who know how to use it, takes on some new meaning when we learn the true identity of the unknown man. First off, the line is very similar to one used by the doctor that Hannah goes to see. The doctor refers to the pregnancy as a potential gift. So I think Adam is using the word gift in a very similar way. Life is a gift. He is referring to the child that he and Marta are eventually going to have. So the life of this unknown man is a gift. And then Adam says, life is a gift for those who know how to use it. So I think that implies that Adam and older Marta used this child as a tool. Throughout the season, we've seen that the trio has been orchestrating events I'm assuming so that Adam and or Eve's master plan can carry through. For example, we saw the trio ensure that the nuclear plant can be built. So it's a pretty dark idea. Adam and Marta have essentially taken this child and from the beginning of his life, turned him into a lifelong time soldier whose sole purpose is to orchestrate events so the apocalypse can happen. Even things like birthing a child with Agnes. So my guess is that this child, this unknown man, has never known true human affection and like I said, has really just been used as a tool by Adam and or Eve. Life is a gift for those who know how to use it. They had this happy gift, this child, and then they used him. Time traveling Marta, the one who abandoned Jonas in 1888, wakes up, as always seemingly from some sort of a nightmare, and sees an older Magnus waiting for her. Magnus says to her, all these years I've wondered why you ditched us in 1888. Who would have thought that 33 years later it would be us who gave you the order? So it sounds like Magnus Adam Sigmundus are the ones that sent Marta back in time to give middle-aged Jonas a piece of the God Particle and then leave. Magnus tells Marta that Adam is waiting for him. Then we see the whole group together, Adam, Francisca, Magnus, etc., all watching as Agnes says goodbye to Silja. Silja, if you remember, is Elizabeth's translator. So it seems like Agnes and Silja are very close because they're both pretty sad when Agnes says goodbye and says it's time. Then Agnes walks out in protective gear to the God Particle. Magnus then activates the machine. So we have to assume Agnes is about to go back in time somewhere, but we don't know exactly where yet. So I already mentioned earlier in the video that I'm very curious to learn more about Agnes's motivation. I'm assuming that in the next episode or two, we'll follow her from here and see exactly where she's traveling to, learn a little bit more about her. Also interesting to see that she has this relationship with Silja. That's a character we know virtually nothing about and someone I'm interested to see more of. Then Marta approaches Adam and says, I did what you asked. Now you have to hold up your end of the bargain. Adam says, you're right. I promise to show you the origin. It took me 66 years to understand how everything is connected. And now it is time that you understand. Adam takes Marta to Jonas's home where Marta's from, in her alternate world, it's her home, but here it's Jonas's, and Adam tells her this is where it all began. Your older self sent you and Jonas back for a single purpose. You were never meant to stop the apocalypse. You were to create the origin. Then he hands her a notebook with the family tree, showing her and Jonas leading to that infinity symbol. Adam places Marta's hand on her belly, basically telling her that her and Jonas are going to have a child together, which is the bridge between both worlds. This child, Adam says, is the beginning of the knot and will be its end. 
your son, Marta, he is the origin. So we finally have the big reveal, and I'm very glad they revealed this midway through the season because I hate when twists get saved for the end of a season or the end of a series because at that point, it's too late in the game. You reveal the twist, but then you don't get to live with the ramifications of it. Here, we find out that this child exists between Jonas and Marta halfway through the season, and now we get to live with it and explore it for four episodes. Also, I think many of us suspected something along these lines, so I'm glad they didn't bury the lead too much. Also, I'm personally beating myself up for not realizing any of this because in retrospect, it should have been obvious that that infinity symbol represented a human being. You see this big family tree branching into that infinity symbol, and then you have this new mysterious character show up, the Lipscard Trio, should have put two and two together, but those are the best kinds of twists, right? The ones where you can very visibly see the breadcrumbs, and Dark is always so good at that. They give you enough information that if you tried hard enough, you can figure it out, so that when the twists get revealed, you buy them and they don't feel unearned. So that's about where the episode wraps up, and I mentioned the montage earlier. I wanted to shout it out in particular, A, just because I thought it was a great montage, but B, the song that plays over it is a song called The Labyrinth Song by someone named Asaf Avidan. And this song, if you listen to the lyrics, is about Ariadne and working your way through a labyrinth, which is the same subject as the play Marta is in in both the prime world and this alternate world. So very appropriate song, and it has a very melancholy and eerie sound to it, which I think fit the montage very well. We see Doris looking at Agnes's yellow blouse. We see Jonas and Marta together, Trant and Claudia together. And then we see Jana sort of sadly looking at the bracelet that Trant left her. So you have a few scenes of joy and a few scenes of sadness. So the melancholy tone of the song works really well. And then the kind of eerie sound works really well to remind us that all of this is happening in a knot, in a world that shouldn't really exist and right before in impending apocalypse. So at the top, I said there were some moments in this episode that really emotionally resonated with me. The montage was one of them. Anyway, with that, we're heading into the end game, and one of the things I'm most excited to see, one of the mysteries I'm most excited to find the answer to, is the seeming disconnect between older Jonas and young Jonas. Young Jonas is on a journey here. He's in the alternate world. He's with this alternate Marta, and older Jonas seems to have no memory of it. How can that be? I had a couple of theories I talked about in the previous episodes, but I've got to think we're not too far away from seeing the answer, and I can't wait to find out what it is. With that, I'll just say if you liked this video, please go ahead and hit that like button hit the subscribe button, and of course the bell icon so you get notified the next time we do a video or the next time we go live. You're especially going to want to make sure you do that so you can keep up with my coverage for the second half of the season, and I do plan on doing a live stream later in the week so we can all talk about the season as a whole, unpack the mysteries, and try to make sense of everything we saw. So with that, thanks for watching, and see you on the next One Take.